Greetings one and all, Super Tuesdays here in the Holy City, Elon More Shechem. We are on the 16th day of Cheshvan, 5784. Title of our class today, with God's help, is Massacre in Israel. Where was God? Okay, first, before we start the class, we always have our m mantra that we say that this class should be a wake-up call for myself, for all of us. Uh, we should, uh, we have in mind that this class should bring out the Divine Presence from the exile, from the depths of darkness and we should become a little bit better Jews and we'll say Amen. We'll start out with our prayer <clears throat> for all the people of Israel, especially the people of the land of Israel, our brothers, the entire family of Israel who are delivered into distress and captivity whether they are on sea or dry land, may, the, may God have mercy on them and remove them from distress to relief, from darkness to light, from subjugation to redemption, now, speedily and soon. And let us say Amen. A big hug to our sponsor, Brother Mike. Uh, he's out there down south. He's been there for... 24 days, unbelievable, doing a lot of holy work. It is an honor to be on his channel, Mike, with his uh, search team looking for missing uh, Jews all over the land of Israel and also training dogs to protect, help assist in protecting Jewish settlements all over the land of Israel. So Mike, hug from all of us. Dearest friends, subscribe to Mike's channel, push that button, share this, get it out. We have to get this message, we have to get this message out to as many people as we can. Okay, so let's take it from the beginning. Before we delve into the subject of where was God during this massacre, I wanted to summarize practical steps that were mentioned in two classes last week. Taking off the gloves, Israel at war, and um, I'll try to add a little bit on. As we know, there's a special, there's an important statement that there is no learning session without new elements. So there always has to be new elements, even though you might be learning the same thing. So we'll expand a little bit. I want to try to go as fast as possible uh, through it with God's help. Okay, here we go. Number one, practical. Uh, improving our Shabbat observance, understanding the laws of Shabbat that we spoke about, this festival, the, the, uh, the festival that took place down south, uh, the festival of nature, the Nova festival, took place desecrating Shabbat, desecrating uh, the last day of Sukkot, Shmini Atzeret. So this is a wake-up call for us. Uh, Rabbi, the famous Rabbi Yaakov Ettinger lived approximately 200 years ago. In his book, Minchat Ani, said an amazing lesson. He looked and he discovered that when Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, that year, which means we don't have the shofar, of course, that year he saw that there were tremendously great events that occurred for the Jewish people uh, in the Torah, in the Tanakh. However, when he continued his investigation, when the first day of Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, like it did this year, he noticed that the worst 
tragedies occurred during that year when the first day of Rosh Hashanah was on Shabbat. So how do we, uh, how do we explain this paradox? He says an amazing, he says that year when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbat, the first day, God judges us during that coming year how we observe Shabbat. According to our, our observance of Shabbat, will bring results, either superb results or, God forbid, tragic. That is an amazing thing. So we have to wake up and improve our observance of Shabbat. Now don't think that if you have a beard um, or you have side curls, then you know the laws of Shabbat. It's years and years and years of study. But if you take one step at a time, we'll see after a while how far we've gone. Number two, we spoke about modesty. Uh, how unfortunately this festival of nature on Shabbat, uh, it was in, in view of the entire world, we, entire world witnessed uh, Jewish people, Jewish women, especially uh, in their nakedness. People were paraded around uh, naked. We just received notice today that one of those girls that was paraded around, she was uh, uh, found without her, she was beheaded. May Hashem have mercy on us. There's an amazing Yarod Vash, Rabbi Yonatan Eifshitz. He lived approximately 350 years ago. I'm going to say again, I'm going to try to stay away as much as possible from my sources. Everything is sourced, of course, whether it's world sources or Torah, Lehavdil sources, everything I have. But I just want to, there's so much information here, I want to make sure that we get it out. So I'm going to try as much as possible not to say sources. If you'd like uh, the source sheet, write down in the comments, Blin Eder. Okay, so Rabbi Yonatan Eivshitz writes the following. He says that in the book of Numbers, uh, Bilam, the Gentile prophet, comes to the king of Moab and he says, Come, I shall advise you what this people will do to your people in the end of days. This Gentile prophet, Bilam, has a vision of what will happen in the end of days. Now, Rav Yonatan Eivshitz in his book, Yarod Vash, he says an amazing thing. What does it mean, the end of days? And I believe, he says, that this is talking about the last day of Sukkot, which is in Israel, Shemini Atzeret, outside the land of Israel, it's Simchat Torah. I believe that this prophet was showing the king of Moab what would happen to the Jewish people and the last day of the holiday of Sukkot. What happened? We know that the suggestion of Bilam to Balak in order to bring the Jewish people to sin was through immodesty, was through prostitution and uh, immoral sexuality. So on the same vein, Rabbi Yonatan Eifshitz says that this is 350 years ago, that he's heard from many, many Jewish communities how on the last day, of Sukkot, men and women, boys and girls, dancing together on Simchat Torah, dancing together on Simchat Torah. And this is what Bilam showed the king of Moab. Amazing. He says, he goes on to say that in my community, we do not have that phenomena but I've heard from many, many other communities. And we lose 
all that we gained from the 22 previous days from Rosh Hashanah until Simchat Torah, until Shemini Atzeret, we lose all that we have gained. And this is the suggestion of Bilam how to bring down the Jewish people. We bring them down through immoral, sexual behavior, immodest dress, dress, etc. That is amazing. And just in parenthesis, in the in the Midrash Hagadol, on a verse in the same portion of Balak in Numbers, who will survive when he imposes these, when God imposes these? What are we talking about? What is God imposing? So the Midrash Hagadol says, woe is it, woe to a person that lives in the end of days during the reign of Ishmael, Muslim, Arab, however you want to call it. Woe to one. Well, folks, it's, uh, we're living in these times, and we can understand. So disgusting what we've seen, uh, what we saw three and a half weeks ago. So those are two predictions of the Gentile prophet Bilam. Modesty. Total trust in Hashem. Third practical advice. We saw three and a half weeks ago a total collapse, perhaps the greatest ever in history, a total collapse of, of Israel's intelligence, military, security, government, all these agencies, the army, total collapse. Trusting only in Hashem. This, now we are able to understand the last Mishnah in Tractate Sota, which says, in the end of days, it brings down a whole list of curses, of terrible uh, phenomena that we will, we will witness. And then it says, the last question is, what can we rely on? Because there's been a total collapse. There's been a moral collapse in society. Only on, only on God. Now we could really understand what this Mishnah was talking about. Next. We're obligated to, via the Torah, also just our own understanding, our own brain. You don't have to be a science, rocket science to get it. Transferring the hostile Arab population out of the land of Israel, compensation, transfer, they're not willing to, then it has to be done. It has to be done by force. Also, this is the Torah commandment, and this is what, uh, this is what a person's common sense tells us. Also, a national, a rabbinical apology to our holy rabbi, Rabbi Meir Kahana, all what he endured, the comments and the, the mud that was, that was spilled on him, cursed out by the establishment and by many uh, rabbinical uh, sources. Okay, next, remembering power of prayer. The Muslims, the Arabs, they have in their name the word God, Ishmael. We must, by our prayers, the Jewish prayers, we could take that power which they have, we could take it away. We have to put the pedal to the metal when it comes to our prayers during these coming days, weeks, however long. We really have to put stress our prayers and take away the power of Islam. 
Next, number six, destruction of Gaza, annexing Gaza to the land of Israel, settling or resettling the land of Israel, and no mercy. Since Hamas won the elections in 2006 and overturning and throwing out the PLO in 2007, they have started four wars. This one is the fifth. This is so no, no Jew in the ruling class, those that have to make decisions when it comes to wars on all levels, government, secret service, intelligence, military, all of them can never say, we are not responsible for the Jewish blood that was spilled. Instead of, at one shot, the first war, finishing them off, we allow them to live another day, fight another day, and improve and progress with their technology and missiles and killing weapons against us. This is suicidal. We are our worst enemies. Four wars. Run away, fight another day. Yeah, and that's what they've done. We have to stop this mercy on, on these cruel people. Folks, the national trauma that the Jewish people all over the world, but more so in Israel, have experienced. There is no cure in our times for this trauma. Men, women, children. I can tell you stories, I teach kids. I can tell you so many stories how frightened kids are and they only hear a little bit. Here and there they hear stories wetting their beds. And the beat goes on. No forgiveness. 1,400 murdered, over 1,400 murdered, 3,500 injured. A national trauma that we will not be able to be cured no forgiveness, no mercy, that this does not happen again. Last but not least, practical advice. We spoke about the walrus. Where does a person run? That shows who we are. Where do we run to in times like this war? And the answer, not to the army, not to the military, not to governments, politicians, analysts, we, went, we must run to study of Torah, practicing Torah, practicing kindness, and also total faith in God. Ein od milvado, there is no, no others than God. Okay, that was a quick summary of practical steps. Moving on. Where was God? The massacre in Israel. A rabbi was once asked this question after the Holocaust. Without batting an eye, the rabbi turned around immediately without thinking and responded, where was man? And that was the end of the conversation. Dearest friends, in life, we have a concept of cause and effect. Cause and effect is if you eat all day and you don't exercise, you're gonna be fat. If you jump off of the 15th floor, uh, you're gonna die. If you oversleep, you're gonna be late 
for school, for work, you're going to miss your bus. Cause and effect. Where was God? <laughs> Let's take a deep look. Where was man? Where were we? We resurrected in 1985, PLO down and out. We spoke about this at length. We will not now. Israel re-resurrected the dead PLO. And they were a new partner, a partner of the Jewish state for peace. So, we, in 1993, we brought an Arab army into the land of Israel. Amazing. We gave the Arabs, the PLO, 30,000 weapons. The PLO, in their charter, it's a must read for everyone. They speak about the annihilation of Israel. When you see these demonstrations all over the world, they're talking about from the river to the sea. There just is no room for the Jewish people. They speak about the annihilation. These are, this is a neo-Nazi organization. And we resurrected them. We save them, we supply them with weapons. This past week, a various organization was able to get its hands on a document from the Ministry of Religion, talking about the PLO. And on this official document, it, is, it talks to the religious leaders, the imami, of the of the mosques and it gives them different points to bring up in their uh, Friday talks now if any of you uh, could help me out you know every week uh, ideas what points I should speak about I guess you know anyways that's how they do it and they're quoting various uh, various uh, verses in their books, in their, what I call the oral law, or the law of the Quran, which is talking about killing the Jews. When you see behind a tree, behind a rock, a Jew hiding, famous verse. They're talking, that is a point. This is the PLO. This is who we resurrected. There is no difference when you look at the charter of both the Hamas and also PLO. There is no difference. The only difference is Hamas has a little bit more of a religious language than the more secular PLO. But it's the same annihilation of Israel, of the Jewish people. The Grand Mufti, the head religious figure, uh, so-called religious figure in the Muslim uh, world here in Israel also speaks there are films of it you could look it up speaking about the annihilation of the Jewish people where was God where were we when Israel in 1967, liberated Gaza. They began to fund the then called, Hamas was then called the Islamic Brotherhood. And they funded various organs of that organization. We helped create this monster. Where was God? Where's our brain? 
2005, we expelled 10,000 Jews from the Gaza area, 10,000 Jews. Later, in the last elections held by Arabs in Israel, when the PLO saw that the Hamas won, that was the last election they've held, they don't want to lose their power and their money and prestige. In 1987, not too long ago, 35 years ago, I saw a document telling school children in the Gaza area that there will be a school trip into Gaza in 1987, a school trip into Gaza. I learned in 1981, I learned in the Sinai Desert, in order to get to my yeshiva, I would have to travel through Gaza. I would travel and sit and wait for rides in Gaza without a weapon. Who's responsible for the Hamas? Who's responsible for turning Gaza into a terror state? Did you hear what I just said? A school, school trips. You don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Maybe both. We're busy. Over the decades, the Jewish people in Israel, we're busy capitulating, surrendering, running away. Showing our weakness in full view to the Arabs, to the Muslims in Israel, the worldwide. There is an amazing verse in the Talmud. Talmud tells us that if you investigate defeat, you will see that the beginning of defeat is running away. How true! The beginning, the bud, the, the, the core of defeat can be found in one running away. And that's what we've been doing for decades upon decades. In 1982, Israel made a treaty with Egypt and expelled all Jewish residents of the Sinai Desert, Yamit, and other communities there. That's where I learned, that's where I lived. And they made an agreement. And still till today, for those with eyes, it's haunting us still. That treaty between Egypt and Israel recognize Israel for the first time recognize the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people did you listen, did you hear those words for the first time in an official world treaty what more a, a state the legitimate right for a people a state? That's what we agreed to. Not only that, from that time, $1.3 billion a year in American aid to Egypt. In our generation, the greatest expert on Egypt is a commander, former commander named Eli Dekel. An amazing guy. That's what his life is. He follows what's going on in Egypt. And he's been warning us the last year or two, that Egypt is revving up for a war against Israel. More than that, this week, Eli Dekel told us that the Hamas attack 
was was sponsored in in a large large percentage was sponsored by Egypt uh, giving equipment ammunition technology to those Hamas terrorists who attacked us three and a half weeks ago you understand what we're talking about amazing we're in hot water remember that name Egypt Two thousand and five, ten thousand Jews expelled. Now, welcome to the the state, the Gaza state of terror, a state of terror. In Judea and Samaria, situation not much better. Running away also. In nineteen ninety three, the Oslo Accords, we gave away autonomy to our holy cities, the city of Shechem, Nablus, Ramallah, Elbira, Hebron, parts, most parts of it. No Jews allowed, there are signs, red signs all over. No Jews allowed, it's dangerous. You just, set, you just signed a peace agreement. How come it's dangerous? You just signed a peace agreement. And then, of course, the bypass roads. The bypass roads. I call them bypassing the land of Israel. Look how many. There's some roads that are a bypass of a bypass of a bypass. It's hard to, it's hard to remember how many times a new road has been uh, made in order to bypass the new problems that have evolved. We willingly surrender, run away from the land of Israel, from our roads. God forbid never to be seen again. From Elon More, the way that for years we would go to Jerusalem, that road is no longer open for Jews. That road is no longer Jewish. And we agreed. And we keep on building these bypass roads. There's a bypass road not too far away from us, from Hawara. And just a few days ago, there were already signs, no Jews allowed. Thank God some, some good Jews in the area took a, a tractor and knocked the sign down. And there's a bypass road of, of El Arub. And there's bypass roads of Lubin El Sharkia and Beit Omer. And in Judea and Samaria, listen to this, put on a seatbelt, check your heartbeat. How disgusting, how low can we fall? In Judea and Samaria, there are 80,000 illegal buildings by the Arabs. But we have good news. The Netanyahu government has taken down 38 out of the 80,000. You know, when I was in uh, LA, they used to have like applause or laugh signs. So you knew what to do. So uh, I'm going to put up that laugh sign for y'all. The civil administration, an organ of the IDF with close to 200 Arab employees from the PA. Can you believe this? When they come to tear down your settlement or your hilltop, they bring the Arab movers to move your furniture and your belongings. 
This civil administration, various organizations recently got their hands on documentation from this, this, lo this losing organization. And it says there in black and white, that Jewish illegal building, how much is there, is a priority for the civil administration and not Arab illegal building. The message to the Arabs are, is clear. This is your land. Build. You're, in, you're at home. Jews, illegal. This is not your homeland. This is the Arab homeland. You think this falls on deaf ears to the Arabs? I'm not even talking about the illegal Arab building in Israel, what they call Israel, in the Galil, Galilee, in East Jerusalem, in Arab cities. The beat goes on. Lebanon, capitulation, surrender, running away. Where was God? Where are the Jewish people? In 1982 to the year 2000, a war began and ended in Lebanon for 18 years. I merited to be at the beginning of that war in the army before they tossed me out. During those 18 years, 1,216 soldiers were killed. In the year 2000, Prime Minister Ehud Barak runs away from Lebanon. A high officer in the Israeli army named Effie Eitam, a colonel in the army, argued vehemently with Barak and he told him he was the last commander on Lebanese soil, on Jewish soil, part of the land of Israel, of course. He told him, you can run away from Lebanon, but Lebanon will not run away from you. Let that sink in. An amazing statement. After the capitulation, the surrender, the running away, the embarrassment of Israel leaving Lebanon, a victory to the Hezbollah and all the other organizations there. May his name be erased. Arafat sees the weakness of the Jewish people in full view. And he masterminds the second intifada, which went from 2000 to 2005. 1,100 Jews murdered during those five years. 8,000 Jews injured. The Talmud yells the beginning. If you're looking for defeat, if, you're, if you want to understand why you were defeated, look. If you check, if you ran away, that is the beginning of the fall. That is the beginning of defeat, running away. Suicide bombers on buses, in clubs. Boy, I remember that, those five years. Those were some of the worst years. Gruesome years. But it continues, folks. This October 2022, a year ago, there was an agreement between Israel, Lebanon, read Israel, Hezbollah. A gas a natural gas agreement between the two. Listen to this. The chief of staff of the Israeli army, the head of the secret service, the head of all 
security agencies, intelligence agencies, came to the Prime Minister and said, the army, we are not ready for a war. I understand, what are, why are you in the army if you're not preparing for war? We are not ready for war. <clears throat> Battles on the ground. We are not ready for war. Cut a diplomatic agreement. And that's what they did. They cut a diplomatic agreement, a capitu capitulation, a surrender. Who's responsible for Israel not being ready to fight a war? That is a whole subject in itself. How many clowns we have in the top brass, if you can call it, of the army who spoke about the years of, of wars on the ground are over. Now it's all technology. There are no more really real wars. Think about it. The last war Israel fought was in the early 80s. It's been almost 40 years. Folks, weep with this information. In Lebanon, in the Second Lebanese War, in, <clears throat> in 2006, Hezbollah had 10,000 missiles and 800 soldiers. Fast forward 17 years, 2023, there's a difference of opinion amongst experts ranging from 40,000 missiles to 150,000 missiles. If we take it somewhere in the middle, we're talking about 80, 90,000 missiles pointed our way. According to the Security Ministry of Israel, they predict in the next war, could be any second, 6,000 missiles a day will be shot into Israel. 1,500 will succeed in hitting built up areas, cities, factories, businesses. 1,500 will succeed. Let's do the math. In the second Lebanon war, we had 120 missiles a day were shot on average. Altogether, 4,000 missiles during, this, during 34 days of the second Lebanese war. 34 days, 53 Jews dead. 4,000 missiles, 120 a day. Let's do the math. If they shoot 40,000 missiles in 34 days, we have 530 dead within 34 days. That's just 40,000. We won't discuss how they've progressed. They, didn't, they don't just have the same missiles that they had 17 years ago. We're in hot water over here. All because of our stupidity. Where was God? Tolerating Arab terror over the decades. The Torah teaches us the Jewish view, the Torah view, the sane view. One that lifts a hand 
against another person, although he does not hit him, is considered to be wicked. The Torah, Judaism is always thinking, if a person lifts up his hand, doesn't hit anybody, doesn't intend to hit anybody, that lifting up of a hand will lead eventually to hitting and then to the next fix, the next step. Clear Jewish Torah thinking. One that hits a Jew is as if they hit the divine presence in Sanhedrin 58. Amazing. If a Jew is hit, if a rock is thrown at a Jew, if a Molotov, if a Jew is stabbed, attempt. This is a desecration of God's name. That should be bothering us. We tolerated rocks. And then we got, we graduated to knives. And we tolerated knives. And we graduated to Molotov cocktails. We tolerated Molotov cocktails on Jews. And we graduated to bombs. And we tolerated the bombs, and we've graduated to missiles. Instead of putting it immediately at an end, to an end. Remember John Lennon's classic, Imagine. Imagine all the people, yeah? Imagine this, folks. If an Arab, 40 years ago, threw a rock and missed. He didn't hit, he missed. He's, he's, he plays for the Chicago Cubs and he missed the target, missed the strike zone. His family is expelled from Israel. His business closed down. How would the land of Israel look today if we did, if we committed ourselves to such a policy 40 years ago. It doesn't interest me if you, if you hit or you missed. But we allow this, we tolerate it. Where I live, in order to get anywhere, you have to go through an Arab town called Khawara. Almost every week, rock throwing, stabbing attempts, Shootings, murders, killings. Does anything change? No, nothing changes. Because we don't have the faith in Hashem to do what has to be done. It could be stopped. This is not a decree from God. This is stupidity of man. Over the last 75 years, we've been funding our enemies. Listen to this and weep. A week or so before the Simcha Torah war, various military security forces, organizations came to the Prime Minister advising more work permits for the Gazans to come into Israel. This will calm the situation. We think we could buy them off. Can you believe this? Leading security, leading military advisors Let's buy the Arabs off. But don't worry about it. There's plenty of Gazans and plenty of Arabs working in Israel. Can you believe this? I'm not getting into detail. I have all the details. There are army bases in Israel that there are Arabs that work there and build the infrastructure of the base. Do we have any wonders how on Simchat Torah 
Arabs who worked in the kibbutzim or in the moshavim, they knew every house. They knew how many people lived in a house. If there were dogs, no dogs. They provided this information over to, in this case, Hamas, but in other cases, all over Israel. How in the world, in the south of Israel, over the last 10 years, how, have, how has the IDF lost tens of thousands of weapons in the south of Israel? How do the Arabs know how to get into the army bases and no one's head is rolling here? Where was God? I don't know where the hell we are. Security guards, quote unquote, in the, in the nature festival, Arab security guards, how they turned and led the charge against the Jews and leading the attack with the Hamas, Arabs from Israel, our Arabs, funding our enemies for 75 years. A father and son, the end of August, a few months ago, two months ago, yeah? A father and son from Ashdod want to save a few pesos, a few pennies, and they come and do a shopping in Hawara, right next to me. And they want to save some pesos and some pennies, and they get a car wash in Hawara, funding our enemies. That was the last car wash. They were both murdered. Right now, all over the internet on YouTube, there's a commercial of a supermarket chain in Israel in Hebrew, trying to target the Jewish population. And they're talking about how they have such great, great prices. The chain is called Baladi. What does that mean in Arabic? My country. Okay, Jews, let's support. Let's support Arabs. Arab supermarket chain that they're calling Israel their country will support them to save a few pesos where the hell is our pride where the hell is our brain and they speak they show you made in Palestine it says on the flower and we get all of our merchandise from Ramallah and we deliver in West Jerusalem to Rubinstein. They give a few names. You can check it out on YouTube. Baladi. Have we lost our mind? Jews ordering from a supermarket chain called Baladi, my country? Supersol in Rehovot. Last week, Jewish shoppers were made to feel very uncomfortable, were humiliated by 20 Arab workers in Supersal. It's a grocery chain in Israel. And then a siren went off for a missile alarm, missile alarm went off. All the Jews in the store ran to the bunkers. The 20 Arab workers stayed in the store, and they began chanting, El Yahud, Jews, Allah Akbar, laughing at us, in the middle of a war, super soul, funding our enemies, there is, a Jewish labor organization called Abodah Ivrit. They have like 
uh, a white pages of, of companies in all types of facets of life. You need a plumber, a Jewish plumber. You need an air conditioned person. Whatever the, whatever the subject may, may be, you could turn to them. In Jerusalem, an Israel court found this white pages directory for Jewish employer, Jewish workers. Something that was a flag of Israel in the 1920s and 30s and 40s is now considered to be racist. The judge said, we don't, in the state of Israel, we don't go according to Maimonides. We have become dependent on Arab labor. It's time to turn the tables around. We have to give monetary incentives for Jews to get back to work. There's a famous expression, it's all in a name. How true. Folks, listen and weep. Arabs, how do they call this battle? They call it the flood of Al-Aqsa, Temple Mount. It's a religious war. How do the Jews, how do we call this? Iron swords, like we just stolen, we've come up to Mr. Asab and stolen his sword. Here lies the difference. This is the whole difference. We're dreaming. We don't live in reality. They speak in religious terms. They understand clearly what the battle is about between Islam and Judaism. If you look in all the operations of Israel, they're the same kind of, same kind of expressions, military expressions. This is a religious war. Folks, what flag are we lifting up? All over Israel. I've been around different cities, different communities also. All over. Signs, flags, unity. The blue and white. Everyone's flying the blue and white. Independence Day, step aside. This is big time now. This is what we have to lift up. We're trying to lift up ourselves. Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Kuk said an amazing line. When we see wars, he wasn't even talking about Jewish wars. Who ever heard of Jews in battles? Something that really hasn't happened in 2,000 years until now. He spoke 80 years ago, 90 years ago, that when countries go to war, the energy of Messiah arises in all the world. That's, that is the direction. That is what Rabbi Cook is telling us. It says in the, in the Talmud, in the Tractate of Megillah 17, it says there that the beginning of redemption is wars. When you see wars, this is the beginning of redemption. We have to step up. We have to go to the next stage. This blue and white flag, it did tremendous good. For many, many, many years, it built the body, the material of the land of Israel. It built the body of the land of Israel. And it has been rewarded and it will be rewarded but there's different stages and all we see is 
in all the cities, all we could see is the same blue and white flag. Like we haven't, we haven't grown up. We haven't taken the step, the next step. Rabbi Kamenetsky has a great example. When a kid's three years old, he reads the ABCs and he gets a new pair of, of tzitzit and it's very cute on him. When he comes age of four, he's still saying the ABCs, that's what he knows. And the tzitzit, the fringes, are getting a little bit tight on the neck. And when he's six years old, he's still reciting the same ABCs. And it looks like he has a bow tie on with those fringes. And when he comes 13 years old and he's still saying the ABC, well, it's choking him to death, those fringes. And it's a little bit embarrassing. That's what we have to lift up. What is the vision of that flag? What is the vision? Please tell me. Now, you're talking to a person, I've said many times in different areas of life, you're messing with the wrong guy because I've been on both sides. I've seen both sides. I was, I'm a big fan years ago. When I came to the land of Israel, big fan of the flag. But what is the vision? What is the goal of this flag? Democracy, state of all its citizens, liberalism, open societies, progress. There's an amazing concept, folks. Something could be beloved and then it can be turned into something that is hated. How could that be? Yes, it could be. During the times of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, during the times of Moses, they built a pillar, a matseva, and it was God found favor. They found favor in God's eyes by erecting these pillars. But then when it comes to Deuteronomy, in the portion of Shoftim, it tells us that God hates the pillars, the erection of pillars. How could that be? Because the pillars which were once holy were hijacked. They were hijacked by the Gentiles, by the Canaanites who lived here. And it becomes something that God despised. Well, let me tell you, this flag, which represents a lot of great things, that's for sure. Perhaps we could summarize, it represents the period of the Ben Yosef, the Joseph Messiah. And now we got to step up. We got to, you finish first grade, you go to second grade. He can't stay in first grade. Our flag has been hijacked. When I see this flag, I can't even look at it. I'll tell you why, dear friends. And this is somebody that loved that flag. When, when the army, when the police, when the border patrol came to tear down, to expel Jews, they came with that flag. When there are various laws that come out of our court system, our judicial system, they are sitting behind that flag when they present anti-Jewish laws. And in the government, there are hundreds or thousands of flags that surround that building. And that building represents, to a great degree, a fight against Torah, a fight against Judaism. Those flags represent Kaplan, what we've seen the last half of year. They're all with those flags, the leftists against any judicial changes. Those flags represent demonstrations against Torah communities that we've noticed, that we witnessed the last half of year, last half year. This, this should be the flag. As Rabbi Cook said, 
when there are wars, this awakens the coming of Mashiach. Wars represent the beginning of redemption. And we're still waving the blue and white. What the hell does it represent? We should be waving the Mashiach flags. We should be waving the God is King flags. The, this flag that I showed, the temple flag. The Arabs are calling it a war of the temple. And we're still with the blue and white. How many of us are content? After, if this blows over, to return to the blue and white. How lovely. Returning to the judicial system, to the Knesset, to the Gentile ways of life, to the wars against the Torah. God forbid, an amazing story of the Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim once was walking, Rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael Mayor Kagan, passed away, if I'm not mistaken, in 1933. Rabbi, the Chavetz Chaim saw a large crowd gathered together outside a synagogue. And he came up to one person, he said, what's everyone talking about? What's the ruckus about? What's the excitement about? And then he was saying about some small event that was happening. And the Chavetz Chaim was so upset and outraged. That's the problem, he said. We should be talking about Mashiach. Instead, we're talking about irrelevant, small news events. How true that is in our days. Talking about this tank, that tank, this mission, that mission. Mashiach, the Chavetz Chaim, cried out. <clears throat> Unity all over Israel in the cities. United, we're victorious. Unity is beautiful. Unity is great. But not all the times. And it depends with who. We have four species on the holiday of Sukkot, Tabernacles. One of them happens to be a willow. Now this is beautiful. As long as as the willow, which represents Jews who have no Torah and no commandments that they do, an estranged Jew. As long as that willow remains with the other three species connected, no problem. As they say, Ahalan Sahalan, welcome. When we take on the last day, the seventh day, the last day of Sukkot, when we take them by themselves, we smack them down on the ground. Only when the willow is interested in being connected to the other three species, which represent Torah, which represent commandments, welcome, we'll embrace you. When you want to go on your own, when you're not interested in embracing Torah, commandments, etc., Smashed. Number two, we have the, of course, the ketoret, the incense, 11 various ingredients of spice, spices that went into the ketoret. And it says in the Talmud that a fast without, without, uh, transgressors is not considered to be a fast. Now, according to the Jewish law, these transgressors, they have to be at least number 11, 12 or 100. They do not compromise, they do not comprise the 10. You need 10 religious people. And then those that are interested in joining our fasts, 
welcome you, we embrace you with open arms. Even though you transgress commandments, you want to be part of our fast, you want to be part of the Torah, part of the commandments, you're welcome. Go in, if you go in alone, there was one spice, it's called the chelbana. I don't know how to translate that. And it had a terrible smell. But when you took 10 great smelling ratio, 10 great smelling spices, and put it together with one foul smelling spice, it was fine. Just like we said, as long as the willow is, is with the three majority of good, no problem. But not the opposite way around. If you leave the chelbana by itself, it stinks to high heavens. Only when interested, when that chelbana is interested in joining up for various commandments, for various Torah reasons, they're welcome. Last week's portion of the week, Lot and Abraham, an amazing bala touring, Genesis 13, 13. It says in the verse that they split. Abraham split with his, uh, with his nephew Lot. If you look, the Balaturim says an amazing thing. If you look at, this, this, if you look at the, these um, four words, the last letters of each uh, of these four words, it comes to uh, peace, shalom. And the Balaturim says, the commentator Balaturim says an amazing idea, that if you want to, if many times, if you want to create peace, you mu there must be a separation. Amazing. We think peace is, is, hug, is uh, uh, you know, lovey-dovey. No. Many times, in order to create peace, there must be a separation. That brings peace. Amazing. So, check that one out. Also, in the Holy Zohar Kadosh, uh, on this verse, it talks about the fact that as soon as Abraham got wind, that his nephew was heading in a different ideological uh, direction. He was no longer within the camp of Abraham in the theology. He left him. He was not willing to join up with him because the Zohar says an amazing line, very simple, straightforward, so true. When we, when the good wants to unite with the bad, the good is usually influenced by the bad. It's easier to be bad than it is good. And therefore, in the end, there's a losing situation over here. So therefore, uh, that what is that the Zohar is telling us, this, what ha this is what happened to Abraham. In the time of Aaron, Aaron was a man of peace. However, when the multitudes, the Erevrav, came to him and they said, listen, we're asking you to do one of two things. Number one, unite us with the Jewish people within the clouds of glory. Two, find, make us another type of leader like the Jewish people have Moses. So Aaron, a man of peace, a man of unity, refused to unite the Erevra, the multitude nations, with the Jewish people. He said, okay, he tried to stall them in making some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, apparatus that would form, be used as a uh, leadership uh, entity. So that's amazing. That's Aaron. The Ketav Sofer says an amazing idea. This is brought down in dozens of books. It says, you shall love peace and you shall pursue it. In Hebrew, the word brodeth is somebody that, usually in the context of somebody coming to kill you. So the Ketav Sofer says an amazing line. He says that there are unities in life, in the world, that have to be pursued like you would pursue to go kill someone. You have to keep it far away. There are certain unities, unifications you have to stay away from. Pursue them to get them, uh, be like a rodef, to keep them far away from us. So, summarizing, unity, beautiful. Most of the people, we're all for it. 
Beautiful. There's been so many great things that have happened in the last couple of weeks with all the tragedies. You know, at least there are, there are lights. However, no unity with those that fight against Torah, that fight against Judaism. No unity with those types of people. Last thing I want to say, and then we'll call it uh, time out till next week, God willing. Last thing which worries me. There's an amazing story. Uh, I'm not going to get into the whole story because I want to keep it short. In the book of the Pro in, in the book of the Judges, there's a story about a couple that there was a fight and then they came back together and then they're uh, trying to get home, but it's getting late. No uh, street lights back then. And they end up in a town, a Jewish town, in the area of Benjamin, not too far away from Jerusalem. There, the whole story there, I'm not getting into it. Uh, the bottom line is this person's wife was raped and, uh, and eventually from the, uh, <clears throat> from the gang rape, she passed away. The Jewish people, the tribes of Israel, were so infuriated, they came and they demanded from Benjamin that they turn over the perpetrators of this tremendous transgression, this tremendous crime. And they refused. Tribal Benjamin, they refused to hand over those responsible. So, people of Israel, tribes of Israel, went out to war. However, very unusual. Forty, in, in two battles, the first two battles, 40,000 Jews throughout the tribes of Israel were killed by Benjamin. 40,000! So the Talmud in Sanhedrin 103b asks a question. How could it be? Was it the wrong thing to do to go and, and declare war? Was it the wrong thing to do? Israel declaring war against another Jewish tribe? And the Talmud says, no, not at all. It was the right thing to do. It was the proper thing to do. They refused to hand over the perpetrators. So why did they fall? 40,000. Why did they lose two battles? Amazing answer. A frightening answer. For the honor of people, when this woman was killed, the Jewish people were willing to go and fight and do battle against another tribe, which they should have done. But when it came to the honor of God, during the time where one another tribe, the tribe of Dan, was running around with an idol, the idol of Micha, that did not bother anyone. No one called for a battle against this desecration of God's name. So because of the fact that what was important to the Jewish people during that time of the judges were, were, was our lives, was the honor of man, we were punished and 40,000 died because we were not as zealous when it came to the Torah, when it came to God's name being trodden upon. This worries me. Should we go out and fight after 1,400 Jews 3,500 uh, uh, injured? Of course, this is the proper thing to do. But where do we stand when it comes to the trampling of commandments, the trampling of Sabbath, the trampling of Torah? Where do we stand? Why are we not up in arms when it comes to desecration of God's commandments, God's names? Till next week.